this video, I will be working through some problems from chapter 19. Let's start with some easy ones. Here's number four. And as I mentioned previously, uh, at least for the following week, I'll be prioritizing problem solutions over lecture videos. So I'll have to present some of the materials, some of the ideas as we go here, as they appear in these problems. First, I'd like to point out that a cubic centimeter, that's a little box, one centimeter on a side. That's also called a milliliter because it's one thousandth of a liter. Uh, and a thousand liters would make one cubic meter. You all know what a liter is if you've purchased a Pepsi bottle, not the two liters, you know, the smaller ones you can drink. Uh, so if there are a thousand milliliters in a liter and a thousand liters in a cubic meter, that means there are one million cubic centimeters in a cubic meter. It may help you to memorize that uh, for future problems that a cubic centimeter is one millionth, 10 to the negative sixth cubic meters. Okay, in this particular problem, we're talking about a quantity of gas that initially occupies a volume of 2,000 milliliters, that would be two liters, also known as two thousandths of a cubic meter. If you like the SI units, we're told how many moles we're dealing with, and we're also told the initial temperature in Celsius degrees, add 273 to convert that into Kelvins, because to use the ide ideal gas law, we must have the temperature in Kelvins. Notice they've given us everything in the ideal gas law except for the pressure. So we could solve for the pressure using the ideal gas law, and we'll do that in a moment. In part A, they first tell us that this gas gets compressed. And we're supposed to figure out the work done on the gas in order to compress it. So here's a little cartoon picture that I keep in my head. This helps me conceptualize things. Here, here's just a, an imaginary boundary around a quantity of gas. It's got volume V. Uh, consider all the little particles bouncing around in there. Uh, the higher the temperature, the faster they'd be bouncing around. And then allow that, allow that band, boundary to expand outwards. Suppose that uh, by virtue of their, their kinetic energy, these particles smash into the walls. You know, if this, were, if this were an actual boundary in space, like a balloon, they smash into the boundaries of that balloon and push it outwards. And in so doing, they do work on their surroundings. Think back to 3A, anytime somebody pushes a crate across the garage floor, they're doing work on the crate. Uh, if you push a car down the street, you're doing work. If you uh, use, a, use a rope to lift something, you're doing work on it against gravity. So a force applied through a distance is work. And when these particles collide with their, with their surroundings, uh, very often the boundary does move outwards. So you've got a force applied over a distance. Here's the little expression for the work done by the gas. It's an infinitesimal quantity of gas if the volume expands infinitesimally. So I've shown this boundary as it would look as after it's been pushed outward just a little bit. So this shell here, this would be the extra volume dV, the, the volume of this entire shell. That's my, uh, that's my dV. And of course, if your gas is expanding, dV is a positive quantity. If the gas had shrunk or been compressed, this X or the, the new boundary would actually be inside the old boundary and dV would be a negative quantity. So if you take the pressure within the, the volume, remember we're treating this as an ideal gas at equilibrium so that the pressure is the same everywhere throughout. Take that pressure, multiply by dV, that would be the quantity of work done by the gas. And it's kind of silly, but imagine just if you have to, Think of yourself in here. What if you had your hands, like if you were standing in this bubble and you had your hands on the bubble and you were pushing the bubble outwards, you can feel yourself doing work on the bubble or really doing work on your surroundings. And the harder you push, the more work you would be doing. And the greater the distance through which you, through which you extend your arms, dV, uh, the greater the work as well. So it's kind of an intuitive expression there. Now this is the work done by the gas. And it may help you to compare that to FDX for mechanics. If you, um, uh, you know, push on that crate as you're moving it across the garage floor, when you scoot it through a tiny displacement DX, this is the amount of work that you've done. And you can check the units here. Can we do this in our heads? Pressure is Newtons per square meter times meters cubed would be Newton meters, joules. Okay, now in your book, they like to use W to represent not the work done by the gas, 
but the work done on the gas. So if the boundary actually moved inwards, dV would be a negative quantity, and the work done by the gas would be negative. Imagine you've got your, your arms extended, your hands are on the bubble, you're inside the bubble, and the bubble shrinks, so you, 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 know, you bend your elbows and your arms get pushed in. You're pushing opposite the direction that your hands are moving. You would be doing negative work. The outside environment is doing positive work on you. So always put the minus sign when you're talking about the infinitesimal work done on the gas. And let's, let's check, if you're compressing a gas, if you're squeezing it inward, you're definitely doing positive work on the gas. DV would be negative in that case, negative, negative, it checks out. You would have a, a positive quantity for DV, excuse me, for DW. So with the magic of calculus, we, uh, we express the total work as the sum of all the little pieces of work as you compress something or let it expand. And that means we're integrating negative P DV. Look at the integration variable, it's volume, which means our limits would be initial volume and final volume. You can only integrate this if you know how pressure depends on volume. Sometimes the pressure is just a constant, it's a number. You can pull it out and it's trivial. But in general, it's going to depend on the volume. You know, is it V squared, V cubed, sine of V? You would need to know what that function is before you can integrate it. So part A is the simplest of all. It's a so-called isobaric compression. So you're, you're squeezing this, this bubble inwards. Imagine compressing it, and all the while, the pressure remains the same. Think about that for a moment. Um, in general, if, if, if these particles are still bouncing around, or, uh, excuse me, if they're still bouncing around at the same speed, but you've now put them in a smaller box, aren't they going to collide with the walls of the container more often, which would mean the pressure should go up? So how are you supposed to compress something you know, decrease its volume from two liters to one meter, one liter, excuse me, two liters to one liter, and yet have its pressure unchanged. The only way to do that would be to slow these particles down simultaneously. Otherwise, they're going to they're gonna hit the walls more often, and that would mean a greater pressure. So as we're compressing this, it's necessary that the temperature drop. And you can see that because if you were to sketch the isotherms, you can see that the final state is that an isotherm with a lower temperature than the initial state. Okay, so an isobaric process is constant pressure. Now, you remember from calculus that when you integrate pressure with respect to volume, this is, this is the P versus V curve, it would just be the area under the curve. So really, we could just take uh, the height of this rectangle times the width. But let's also do that analytic, analytically. So for constant pressure, you can pull the P out in front, and you'd have negative P integral of dV, well, the antiderivative of one with respect to V would just be V, evaluate at your limits, you've got V final minus V initial, in other words, delta V. So this is really just negative P delta V. And that's what I just said a moment ago, because P would be the height of the rectangle, delta V would be the base of the rectangle. The minus sign accounts for the fact that um, in a compression, uh, the change in volume is actually a negative quantity, right? Final minus initial, notice the arrow, we're going from two liters to one liter. One minus two would be negative one liter, negative, negative. We find that the work done is positive. If you are compressing a gas, you are doing positive work on the gas. Okay, if we want this answer to come out in joules, we have to use SI. So over here in a corner, I'm gonna find space to solve for the pressure. Let me use the ideal gas law of pressure. Uh, I'm thinking per inert, so N R T over V. We know all these quantities, so let me evaluate that. We're told that we're dealing with 0.1 moles <clears throat> times the gas constant of 8.31, that's SI units times the Kelvin temperature of 573. We divide by the vo initial volume. Yeah, because what I'm doing is evaluating this at the initial state. So I have to use initial temperature, initial volume, and I'll get the pressure initially. Of course, that's also the final pressure. Um, darn it, did I hit the divide button? I've forgotten, I think I did. 
Okay, divided by two thousandths of a meter. Okay, I think this number sounds reasonable. That would be, looks like 238 kilopascals, 238 kPa. That's like a little more than double atmospheric pressure. Atmospheric pressure is 101. I'm gonna check the solutions manual and see if they got the same pressure here. Okay, I don't see it, so moving on. And let me just calculate the work. So if I take that 238 kilopascals and multiply it by, um, well, if I go from two to one, that's a drop of negative one liter, which is 1,000. So 0 0.001 with the minus sign. And that comes out to be positive 238 joules because I had a minus sign here and the delta V was also negative. Your solutions manual has the number 240. Close enough, they rounded. Okay, part B. This time, the, compre the compression occurs not at constant pressure, but at constant temperature. Remember, if, if an ideal gas uh, goes through a state change or a series of states where its temperature is always constant, we're talking about movement along an isotherm. So I can go ahead and draw an arbitrary isotherm. And this time we're being compressed just like before from two liters to one liter, but the area is going to be different. Now, would you expect this to be more work or less work than the original or the, the, the case in part A? To me, I'm thinking more work because the curve scoops up we should have more area under the curve. Physically, how do we account for that? Well, if the temperature doesn't change, then these particles are not cooling off like they were in party. So as you compress them, they're still bouncing around just as hard. You are gonna to have to do more work on them as you compress them. So it kind of makes sense physically that this would come out greater. Okay, now you don't look at that and just think of some formula from geometry. We can't use one half base times height like a triangle uh, it's not even a, a trapezoid. So we are going to have to integrate. But fortunately, it, it's easy. This is always true for the work done on a gas. Negative integral of PDV. Well, for constant T, and this, by the way, I'll point out this is an isothermal process. Um, P equals nRT over V is a, whoop. okay, well, this is a little misleading. This is always true. This is the ideal gas law. And it's always true for ideal gases. So when I say for constant T, I'm not referring to this result. I'm referring to the following here. Integral of, let me insert the expression that I just wrote down for P. Instead of P, using the ideal gas law, I can substitute nRT over V dV, and let's pull out all the constants. Because it's an isotherm, T does not change. R is the gas constant, and for a closed system, the number of moles doesn't change. So I will pull out the negative nRT, and I'm really just integrating dV over V from V initial to V final. And this is where your first semester calculus pays off. Isn't it nice when you actually get to use all that stuff that you learn? You know what the antiderivative of one over V is. That would be the natural log. So negative NRT, uh, LN of V, and I'd have to evaluate at my lower and upper limits. And we would have LN of V final minus LN of V initial. But I'm gonna just quote that result that you should know. The difference of logs is the log of the quotient. Difference between two logs is the log of the quotient. So I can write this as the natural log of V final over V initial. Is it worth memorizing that? Possibly. It shows up so much, you may end up memorizing it anyway. Otherwise, throw it on your note card for the next exam. But more importantly, know how to get it. Uh, because 
it's not difficult to get that result. Now, if you wanted, you could use the minus sign to reciprocate this or take, take the reciprocal of the fraction because remember uh, the log with any base, the log of x to the a is a times log of x. In this case, our a is negative one. So I could put the negative one as a power right here. And if, when you raise something to the negative one power, you just take the reciprocal. So if you wanted, you could get rid of the minus sign and put V initial on top. Now, I think it's worth considering something here. Um, this is going to show up, especially those of you who take more physics, this is going to show up so often. Let's get a mental picture in our heads of any logarithmic function. Okay, log base anything of x. Oops, I should label that right here. Log base anything of x. Uh, for instance, what if a is 10? What is the log base 10 of 1? What number, or 10 to what power equals 1? Well, that would be 10 to the 0 power. So we know that the log of 1 is 0. That's why this curve intercepts the x-axis at 1. You should just memorize that. No matter what your base is, the logarithmic function takes on a value of zero at x equals one. So when you take the log of x, some number x which is greater than one, you get a positive number. I know this is not standard notation here, but if you take the, the log of a number which is greater than one, you get a positive number. As you can see from the graph, it's positive. When you take the log of a number which is less than one, of course it's gotta be greater than zero, it's gotta be somewhere in here, then your log comes out negative. So let's go over here. What type of work are we doing on the gas? We're compressing it, we're squeezing that gas inwards, that's positive work. So we know that this has to come out positive. Now V initial is less than V final, is it not? So if, if you're dividing a number by a number smaller than your first number, this ratio would be greater than one, right? No, I got this backwards, I'm sorry. The, uh, the initial volume was two liters, the final volume is one liter. So we're really taking the log of one half. One half is in between zero and one. When you take the log of a number in here, a negative number comes out. You should just memorize that. The log of a number between zero and one is negative. And we're taking the log of one half in this problem. So we're gonna get a negative number, negative, negative, makes positive. Okay. So let's finish this. We've got negative 0.1 moles, 8.31 joules per mole per Kelvin times, I believe it was 573 Kelvins times the natural log of one half. And that number comes up often. Again, you could take the minus sign and put it as a power here, one half, so the negative one power would be two. And the natural log of two shows up all over the place in physical sciences, 0.693. You're gonna see that a lot. Uh, if you took 3B, you probably saw it when you talked about um, a charging or discharging capacitor. So let me plug all those numbers in. And I find that this time we did 330 joules of work, which is the same answer your solutions manual got. As we expected, that's more than the work we had to do at constant pressure. So for an isothermal process, those particles are not slowing down. They're still banging into the walls as hard as they were previously, so we're gonna have to squeeze harder as we compress it. That means more work. Number seven in your homework is a very simple problem, making use of the first law of thermodynamics which we have not yet talked about. So you learned three laws in mechanics, Newton's first, second, and third laws. Now we've got this, this new set of results referred to as the, the laws of thermodynamics. And really, the, you're gonna encounter two. Um, most of the homework that we do in the next few chapters just relies on two. Arguably, there is a zeroth law of thermodynamics, which we'll talk about. It's kind of trivial. And I think I've encountered a third law as well. It kind of depends which book you pick up, but two major laws. The first one is fairly intuitive, or at least it should be intuitive. Uh, I like to, to think of it as the universal truth about diet plans, diet programs. 
This is the law that debunks all fad diets. Of course, this law applies to thermodynamic systems like uh, volumes of gas, but you can also apply it to the human body. E-thermal. Uh, revisit some, some of the chapters from mechanics where they defined thermal energy, but it's really just the combined kinetic energy of all these particles in the gas bouncing around. That's pretty much it. For an ideal gas, remember, we pretend that there's no interaction between these. Now, in a solid, the particles are much closer together, and they interact via uh, forces that we can think of as little springs. There's springiness between all the mutual pairs of particles. And so, in that case, the thermal energy would include not just the jiggling, that's the kinetic energy, submicroscopic kinetic energy, it would also include the potential energy stored in those springs, those submicroscopic springs. But for the ideal gas, there are no springs because there's supposed to be no interaction. And the only con contribution to the thermal energy would be the kinetic energy of these particles. Now, you've already heard that the higher the temperature, the faster these move. The temperature tells us the average kinetic energy of the particles. So when you raise the temperature, you raise the average kinetic energy of all these particles, that means you've raised the thermal energy. For an ideal gas, the thermal energy really only depends on one thing, and that is the temperature. Of course, it also depends on the number of particles you have, but if that's fixed, the temperature completely determines the thermal energy. That's true for an ideal gas. It's not necessarily true for real gases. Okay, so how do you, how do you increase the, the temperature and hence increase the thermal energy of a quantity of gas? Well, the obvious one, the one we all know about, is to give heat to it, to add heat. And let's get this out of the way right now. Uh, some of these books get really uptight about the use of the word heat. Uh, I guess because historically, people thought that heat was an actual invisible fluid that was conserved and it flowed between objects. You couldn't necessarily see it. You know, there was a fixed amount of this heat fluid in the universe. And by the uh, late 18th, 1800s, maybe even 1700s, it was clear that that's bogus. So uh, people get a little uptight about the use of the word heat. Just relax. Uh, your book defines heat as energy in transit. Heat is energy as it's going from a hotter object to a colder object. And it's, it's really, that energy is really imparted by the, the submicroscopic collisions between the hot particles and the cold particles. That's really it. So heat is just energy that's being transferred because of the temperature difference. No more sophisticated than that. So you could put, uh, you could put your balloon over an open flame and give it energy that way, or you could compress the balloon. Because we've already seen that when you, when you squeeze a gas into a smaller volume, you're doing work on it, and you're actually adding energy into the system. One way I like to think about it is this. As you're moving these walls inwards, if you're compressing the gas, aren't the walls kind of like uh, banging into the particles? It's, it's like if you, had a, if you were playing ping pong. When you, when you smack the ball with the paddle, you're doing work on it and speeding it, speeding it up. And it's the same idea here. When you move the walls of the container inwards, they're colliding with the particles. You're doing work on those individual particles, but we don't worry about that. We just say we're doing work on the gas as a whole. Okay, so either one of those would increase the thermal energy. And what I said about diet fads is this. Instead of considering a quantity of gas and the thermal energy due to the, due to the kinetic energy of all the particles within, just think about your body. Uh, I don't know much about the, the biochemistry, but you know, stored in your liver, I think, is, is it glycogen? You know, you eat a bunch of pasta, overnight the carbohydrates get stored somewhere in your body, and, and you can draw off of that the next day. You can go run a marathon. I would never do that, but some people do. You can draw off of all those stored carbohydrates, and there's chemical energy in the bonds of those large molecules. Same with your fat tissue. Your, your fat stores a whole lot of energy. And, and if, you, if you take the sum of all that chemical energy, all the protein that's storing energy, fat, carbohydrates within your body, think of that as the total energy. And um, there are two ways to change that quantity. You could stuff more food in your face. That's Q. Put more food in your body. I don't know of any other way to store energy uh, uh, as food. I mean, I guess intravenous, I suppose, but you can't, you can't like pour gasoline 
into your stomach because that's not usable. So it's gotta be food or drink. That's Q. The other way to change the energy in your body is to do work. Now you can't really, this is where the, the analogy is not perfect because with the gas, a gas could expand and do work on its environment or the environment could squeeze the gas and do work on the gas. So W could be positive or negative. Um, but I don't really see how we can compress a person's body and, and add energy to them that way. So I'm really just talking about the work done by the person. So that's really the calories that you burn every day. And that would include your metabolism, or as my friend likes to call it, your metabolism. So if you do 3,000 calories of work in one day, that includes exercise and all the energy that your organs burn just to keep your body operating. If you do 3,000 calories and you put 3,000 calories into your body in the form of food, you've got 3,000 plus negative 3,000. Remember, uh, W is the work done on the gas. So in this case, it would be on the body. So if the body's doing work, that would be a negative number. 3,000 in, 3,000 out, the change in thermal energy or energy would be zero. It is impossible to gain weight that day. It's as simple as that. If you consume just as many calories as you take in on any given day, you are not going to gain weight. If you did, you would be violating the first law of thermodynamics. Good luck with that. So all those diet fads that, I always see these commercials, I'll make this quick, but I always see these commercials where there's some guy, they're on YouTube now, they're like 20 minutes long. This guy's talking about how, I, I, used, to, I used to run like five miles a day and I would eat nothing but vegetables and lean meats and I restricted my, my diet and I did this for months. And, uh, and all the while I was like hundred pounds overweight. It's like, dude, you were not running five miles a day when you were hundred pounds overweight. And I don't believe anything you're saying because if you are doing more work each day than the calories that you're taking in, each day your delta E would be a negative number. You can't create energy from nothing. Okay, so if more people were educated about the first law of thermodynamics in high school, Perhaps fewer people would be making money off of these bogus diet pills. Let's move on. Um, pardon me for that diatribe. <clears throat> That's what happens when you listen to a lot of AM radio. Let's look at the uh, PV diagram for the, the particular process in, in this problem. The gas starts out at some initial volume, and the pressure goes straight up with no change in volume. See how the pressure is increasing, but there's no change in volume. So this is initial state of the gas and final state of the gas. Well, the work done, that would be the integral of P dV from V initial to V final. There's a couple ways to see that that is zero. In calculus, you know that if you integrate from A to A, for instance, it's zero. If these limits are equal, there's, there's no area under the curve. You can also just see that there is no area under this curve. So you should memorize that a so-called isochoric process involves no work. If you're not squeezing the gas into a smaller volume and you're not allowing it to expand, nobody's doing work. There's no work done. That's an isochoric process that means constant volume. Okay, so when we go up to the first law of thermodynamics, no work is being done. The only reason this thing would be increasing its thermal energy would be the addition of heat. So this is either over an open flame or it's, brought, it's been brought into contact with a much warmer body. It's, you know, some people have cold hands all the time, right? And they grab your hand. If your hand's warm, you warm up their hand. So uh, that would be conduction. We'll get to that later. But um, the only reason why the, the energy is increasing is because of Q. So your book is asking you to make a bar chart and Here's how they do it. Delta, isn't that final minus initial? So I could write this. I'm going to dispense with the TH. Let's just, let's just say E final minus E initial is Q plus W. And you could write that as, I'm going to put the E final, but well, let's do this. Put the E initial over here with these guys and then flip the whole thing. So we get this E initial plus Q plus W equals E final. Uh, I'm going off your solutions manual here. We're supposed to do some bar charts. Okay, so let's draw like a, an axis here. Your book does this, plus and minus. Uh, the initial energy, presumably, well, can you have negative energy? 
for these particles. I mean, there's no such thing as negative kinetic energy, right? So let's just start with a positive bar. This represents the energy that we start out with. Now, what's the bar for W? There is no bar, it's, it's at zero. No, workers, no work is done. However, some heat is dumped into the system. We can represent that with this bar. Okay, so the energy we start out with due to the uh, non-zero temperature, plus the heat that's added, plus no work. Uh, you just take the heights of these, add them together, and there's your final energy. And you can also see that by considering the isotherms, right? Didn't we end up on an isotherm that's farther from the origin? So as you go, as you cut across the isotherms in that direction, you're, you're moving towards states of the gas with higher temperatures. If you wanna use the human body analogy, um, let's say you're 150 pounds on Tuesday and um, you're really bummed about your exam grade. So you have your classmates over and you guys watch a movie and eat as much pizza as you possibly can. You just put a bunch of uh, Q into your body and since you sat on the couch the whole time, let's just pretend no work was done by you. So this is you on Wednesday. All right. Here's an interesting problem. This one was intended to be about the human body. It deals with how effective the body is at cooling by perspiring, perspiration. Uh, you know, a lot of us find it pesky, the need to wear antiperspirant if you're into that or deodorant, but uh, it's pretty essential to cool your body because without, without sweating, there's really, we have no other way of rapidly cooling our body. Dogs pant, people sweat. Okay, here's a nice little graphic to keep, to keep in your head. Imagine um, a small puddle of water or a bucket of water and just look at the surface of the water. I've just drawn some silly little, silly little particles here bouncing around due to the thermal energy, you know, whatever the temperature is, all those little particles are jiggling around, flowing, and the fast, or the hotter your water is, the faster these would move. Well, some of these move faster than others. This one might be moving a little bit faster than that one, for instance, but they're always bumping into each other and exchanging kinetic energy. It's just like when you play pool, when you break at the beginning, you can see all the billiard balls collide and exchange energy. One of them might be going faster than another, but then they collide together and now the other one's going faster. So they're, they're constantly redistributing their energy, um, but the ones that occasionally, you can think of it this way, one of them gets kicked off particularly quickly, and it just escapes altogether. So in doing so, it's, it's just taken away a significant amount of energy from what remains behind. The, the particles that evaporate carry with them a good deal of energy. Where did they get that energy? It came from the particles that remain. So to, to induce a phase change in a liquid, to take a lot of those particles from the liquid to the gaseous phase, requires quite a bit of energy. And typically uh, that energy, well, I shouldn't say typically, but um, you, know, you could be accomplishing that with an open flame, or you could just be drawing that energy from the liquid itself. The, the energy's gotta come from somewhere. And in the case of perspiring, let's think of it this way. It really does come from the sweat. If this is a, a small amount of sweat on your skin, the particles of sweat, and sweat's mostly water, I suppose, uh, the particles that evaporate take with them a significant amount of energy from the particles that remain. And that would cool the, uh, the water that remains. Well, if the sweat on your skin is colder than your skin, then heat will immediately flow from your skin into the sweat. So there's heat always just being drawn away from your body. And if we could just calculate <clears throat> how much energy it takes to evaporate your sweat, we will know how much energy is taken from your body. Um, in other words, the rate at which you could, you could cool off, I, I suppose. We're not actually gonna calculate the temperature change of your skin here. We're just calculating how much, um, how much power is involved uh, because energy per time, we're really talking about power here. So it's worth revisiting this ubiquitous graph from your book. Let's back up a sec here. Take a chunk of ice straight out of the freezer. It's very cold, colder than zero degrees. Throw it in a saucepan on your stove, turn on the flame. The first thing that happens is your ice warms up. 
uh, it might be at negative 20 degrees. Eventually, it's going to warm up to zero degrees if we're talking about if we're talking about water, and then it's all going to melt. None of that liquid is going to get any hotter than zero until it's all been melted. Because remember, um, you've got the flame under that saucepan. If some of the, the water is still frozen at zero degrees, and, and then the heat went into the water that's already been melted and raised it to like five degrees, wouldn't the heat immediately flow back from the five degrees Celsius water into the zero Celsius ice? That's the direction that heat flows. So you really can't have the water get any hotter than the ice until it's all melted. Once it's melted, which is the opposite of freezing, um, then the temperature can start to rise. So it takes quite a while to get that water from zero degrees all the way up to 100 degrees. And then the same reasoning applies. You're going to have to wait for all the water to boil before that steam can be made any hotter. Now, in your kitchen, you can't actually make the steam hotter because it's already escaped at that point into your room. And into the uh, into the kitchen air. Okay, so here's the number given to us. One kilogram of water, again, that's like a, a smaller Pepsi bottle. One liter of water has a mass of one kilogram. It takes a whopping 2.4 million joules to induce a phase change of that one kilogram of water from liquid to gas. That, that's an enormous amount of energy compared to what it takes just to raise the temperature by one degree. Remember, um, what is it? For one kilogram, you need 4,000 joules. So 4,000 versus 2 million. We're talking, what is that, like 500 times more energy? Very roughly speaking, it takes 500 times more energy to evaporate water than it does just to raise its temperature by one degree. I believe that's correct. So that's called the latent heat of vaporization. Latent heat of vaporization. You can think of it two ways. That's the amount of energy it takes to, that you have to put into a system in order to evaporate that one kilogram of water, or you could look at it the opposite way. If you let the water condense from vapor back into liquid, it will give up that much energy. And these are things that are measured in a laboratory. So if, if it takes this many megajoules for one kilogram, how many megajoules would it take for three kilograms? You would just multiply this by three. So the, the heat required to vaporize something. The heat of vaporization would be the, the latent heat of vaporization. That's the per kilogram heat times the number of kilograms you're talking about. So LM, I think your book usually writes ML. And uh, what are we talking about? In this problem, they tell us that uh, a typical human is capable of eva evaporating 30 grams of perspiration. No, they actually tell us that our our sweat glands produce 30 grams of perspiration per minute. So 30 grams per minute. And let's just suppose that we can evaporate all of that almost immediately because we're outdoors and the surface of our bodies is very warm. And you know, there, if there's a breeze, I think the way it works is if there's a breeze passing over your skin, these particles get removed quickly and then that makes it easier for more of them to evaporate. I think that's the basic idea. Okay, uh, I also want to point something out here. Here's a fun number to memorize, and I only have it in my head because of 3A. One gallon of gasoline. If you have a, a car and you go fill it up with gasoline, each of those gallons has something like 120 megajoules. I'm going to put that off to, in the corner here. One gallon of gasoline is something like 120 megajoules of energy. So how many <clears throat> gallons of water could you boil? Excuse me, how many? Kilograms of water, could you boil? 50, no, I didn't do that right, did I? 120 divided by 2.4. Interesting, 50, okay. So you, you could boil 50 liters of water with the energy in a single gallon of gasoline. And I find that interesting because my home runs off of propane. Propane would have a similar energy content. So it's nice to know that one gallon of propane <coughs> I can use that to boil 50 liters of water. Okay, so what they're really asking is uh, how, much, how many joules per second could be taken away from the human body in the form of heat? And we'll go ahead and call that P for power because we're doing the amount of heat per unit time. Well, we just take the uh, 
number of joules per kilogram to evaporate times how many kilograms we're talking about. And we divide that by the time interval. And I think they were asking for per minute. Yes. So one minute. And we'll put this into SI units here. Okay, so 2.4 megajoules per kilogram times, well, 30 grams, that's, that's 30 thousandths of a kilogram. So times 0 0.03 kilograms. This is how much heat is drawn away from the body when we evaporate 30 grams of sweat. And if we do that in a time of 60 seconds, we're gonna come out with uh, joules per second. That's a wattage. And really what we're calculating is what's, what's the cooling rate in watts? 2.4 million times 0 0.03 divided by 60 seconds. Remarkable, 1,200 watts. I could write that as 1.2 kilowatts. That's almost exactly the power of your microwave oven. Now, why would the human body need to be able to shed heat at such a large rate? 1.2 kilowatts? Is that even necessary? Well, if you do some reading, you'll discover that uh, the human body can easily develop that much mechanical power. If you're running upstairs, wrestling, swimming as hard as you can, various other activities, you could easily be developing more than one kilowatt of power. And, and remember, I sh excuse me, the, I meant to say remember that the, um, the efficiency of the human body, it's probably something like 20%, 30%. I don't actually know. So, you know, if you calculated the physics work, MGH, that it takes to run upstairs, uh, let's just say that it takes uh, 200 joules to run up a flight of stairs. I'm making that number up. You have to metabolize something like five times that because when, you, when your body breaks, open or breaks apart the uh, fat or carbohydrate molecules to get that energy out, or is it ATP? I don't know. I'm not, I'm not a biochemist, but when they break apart those organic molecules to get the energy out, only some of it actually gets used for actual work. So if you're doing um, 500 joules per second of mechanical work, that's, that's half of a kilowatt, you could easily be actually metabolizing one and a half kilowatts, two kilowatts, that's 2000 joules per second. And that's just heat that's, that has to be shed from your body, otherwise your temperature would immediately skyrocket and that's no good because your brain's going to denature it's proteins in your brain. That, that's, in fact, I think that's the main reason why most animals, I'm rambling here, I'll wrap this up. Um, most animals that run fast, they have to stop quickly because if they didn't, they would overheat. They can't shed heat that quickly. Okay, so that, that is why we were able to shed 1,200 joules per second of heat. It's because we can easily produce that much. And I'm assuming that if you were to exert yourself at an even greater rate, you would have to sweat more than 30 grams. I don't know what happens at that point. Um, yeah. Okay, anything else we can say about this problem? You don't need to memorize this value, but you do need to know how to use it. And your book points out that, like, don't get too attached to this number as the heat of vaporization for water because most other problems uh, the water is undergoing the phase change from liquid to gas when it's at the boiling temperature, 100 degrees Celsius. So we're talking about evaporating water at a considerably lower temperature. And at a lower temperature, the particles are moving more slowly. They might even be a little closer together. So it actually takes more energy to break their bonds. So this latent heat of vaporization is a little greater than the one you would find for the 100 degrees Celsius boiling point. The next problem I will look at, number 18, requires the, the notion of specific heat or heat capacity. Very important topic from, from this chapter. It's going to show up a lot in the subsequent chapters. Simply put, the, the heat capacity or the, the specific heat, some books call it specific heat capacity. Uh, it's, uh, you've got a, a particular value for different materials. It's the, the number of joules or how much heat how much energy you have to dump into that substance, specifically one kilogram of that substance, in order to raise the temperature of that substance by one degree Celsius, which is the same as one Kelvin. That's it. If, if you've got 
one kilogram of this substance, how many joules of energy do you have to dump into it to get its temperature to rise by one degree? And if you've never thought about this before, you might, you know, your first assumption might be, well, shouldn't it just be the same for all materials? Why would it, why would it be different? Well, different materials are made out of different atoms, different molecules, and so their behaviors are very different. Let's look at some, some values here. I'm looking at the first column uh, at present, and what immediately jumps out is water. water. Water far and away has the largest specific heat. By the way, the, the use of the word specific means per kilogram. Because, uh, for instance, let's say you've, you've got a cast iron cooking pan on your stove and you also have an aluminum pan. If I ask the question, um, do you have to dump, you know, for, for which pan, the iron or the aluminum one, for which pan do you have to put in more heat in order to raise its temperature by one degree? Well, you might compare the heat capacity for aluminum to the heat capacity for iron and say, aluminum is higher, you're going to have to put, you're gonna to have to put more energy into the aluminum to raise its temperature by one degree Celsius. But what you've overlooked is, it depends on how much material is in your pan. What if your aluminum pan is very thin, lightweight, and your iron pan is huge? Uh, you're gonna to have to put more energy into the iron to, to raise its temperature by one degree. So it's not just the, um, the heat capacity that you see in the column here, it also depends on how much mass you're talking about. And that's why they use the term specific heat. If you just say heat capacity, you're really talking about uh, an arbitrary chunk of substance that could have any mass. When you say specific heat, you're talking about per kilogram. Okay, so we've looked down here at water. It takes over four kilojoules just to raise the temperature of water by one degree uh, per kilogram. So if, if you've got a liter of water, it takes over 4,000 joules to raise its temperature by one, um, one degree Celsius. And I believe that's all, also the definition of the calorie. Uh, the calorie with a capital C, no, lowercase c, Oh, I forget. I believe it's capital C. Yeah. Uh, calories, the amount of heat required to raise one kilogram of water by one degree Celsius. Sometimes people refer to this as thermal inertia. Your book uses that phrase. Um, you know, mass in mechanics, mass is sometimes used interchangeably with inertia. The more massive something is, the harder it is to get it moving or change its direction if it's already moving the more inertia it has. Um, similarly here, the higher something's specific heat or heat capacity, uh, the, more, the more energy you have to dump in in order to change its temperature. So if something is a high heat capacity, it's more reluctant to change temperature, shall I say. And if you're wondering, you know, what's up with that? Why would it be different from one substance to another? Well, remember, thermal energy includes, and I don't, I, I'm just showing you one graphic here, but the thermal energy of a liquid or a, uh, a solid includes not just the jiggling of the particles, that's the kinetic energy, it's also the energy stored in those um, submicroscopic springs. We like to think of them as springs. So some materials might have stiffer springs, and that means there's more energy stored in them. That's one way to think about it. Okay, so I'll just say one more thing about this here. Um, I've started cooking with cast iron, and I've noticed that the pans they stay warm for a long time. Uh, some pans, saucepans, you know, like five minutes after you're done cooking, you can, you can put your finger on it, it's not gonna burn you. But these iron pans stay hot for a long time. And that kind of surprises me because I'm looking at the heat capacities here, and iron is considerably lower than aluminum. Um, it's about the same as copper. I don't think anybody's cooking with lead these days. So I'm a little puzzled by why, because if you read about cast iron, everybody likes to tout that benefit. Oh, it, it retains heat really well. And I suspect it's just because they tend to be heavier pans. There's more iron than there would be aluminum in an aluminum, like a stainless steel pan. Um, anyway, it, maybe they're not pure iron anyway. I know there's some carbon in there. But the value that we need for this problem is the 900. And but before I move on, over here we've got capital C, joules per mole per Kelvin. You can also express the amount of heat required to raise one mole of a substance by one Kelvin. Um, just, just a different way to express it. 
but those are typically used for gases. So I would just try to, to memorize that. It's more typical to use capital C for gases and lowercase c, the per kilogram for solids. And let me draw your attention to something that you should already be aware of because you've already read the chapter. Isn't it remarkable that these all have practically the same capacity per mole, molar specific heat? It can't be a coincidence, right, that these are all so similar. And we're gonna see that the answer is, um, I think, very exciting because the way we're gonna account for the similarity is by modeling um, atoms, really. We're gonna, we're gonna have a little cartoon picture in our head of something much too small to actually be seen with visible light. And yet this model leads to accurate predictions about things you can measure in a laboratory. Because this is something you would measure in a lab, right? You know, go ahead and put something over a flame, calculate how much heat you've, you've put into that substance, measure its temperature change, and you could determine its heat capacity. Uh, last point here, I, I think I've said that like three times already. If these numbers are all so similar, then why are these numbers so different? Shouldn't they also be similar? Well, don't forget that these substances have different densities. Here, we're saying it takes about the same amount of energy per mole, but if you just take one kilogram of each of these substances, you're talking about different fractions of a mole because the densities are different. Okay, so the, the premise of this problem is you've got a, a scientist and it says that her, um, her scale is broken. She's got some chunk of aluminum. That's this, uh, this little box I drew here. And she needs to know how heavy this chunk is, how many grams are in this chunk of aluminum. But her digital scale is broken. <clears throat> but she's hip with her thermodynamics, so she realizes there's another way she could do it. She's got a heating coil. Here's my silly drawing of a heating coil. And she knows that that coil puts out two and a half kilowatts of heat. Now, the way I've drawn it, obviously, a lot of that heat would be escaping into the air and not actually going into the aluminum. So forget about that. We're supposed to pretend it's 100% efficient. Maybe there's some way you could rig that up. But all the heat is going straight into the aluminum at this rate, 2,500 joules every second. And she does that for a time interval of 30 seconds. And we already know that it takes 900 joules to raise one kilogram of aluminum by one Kelvin in temperature. We're told that the initial temperature is 20. What is that, room temperature? And the final temperature is nearly body temperature. I think body temperature is 37. So the change in temperature, that's not delta lowercase t, delta capital T. Do we need to add 273, add 273 to get our temperatures in Kelvins and then subtract? Of course not, because the 273s would cancel. If you're just interested in a temperature difference, there's no need to convert. So the temperature rises by 15 Kelvins. Uh, yeah, so there it is. All we have to do is plug this into uh, our formulas here. She puts it on the coil. And when she first turns on the coil, she measures the temperature to be this. She leaves it on there for 30 seconds and finds that at the end, uh, it's risen to this temperature. Now, think about it conceptually. If she left it on there for 30 seconds and the temperature barely changed, what if the temperature only went from 20 to like 22 degrees? That would, be, that would mean that all that energy she dumped in, all that, excuse me, all that energy she dumped in only managed to budge the temperature by a couple degrees which would imply that that material has a very large thermal inertia. In other words, it would have a very high specific heat. So the smaller the temperature change for a given energy input, the greater the heat capacity, or if you're talking about a per kilogram basis, that would be specific heat. Specific heat capacity, that's what some books call it. The book just says specific heat. Okay. Here's the, uh, here's the equation we need. The quantity of energy dumped into this material or, uh, that would need to be dumped in for a given temperature increase. Just look at the units. C has units of, I was going to use a different color here, but joules per kilogram per Kelvin. I, I wrote it this way originally to make it clearer, 
it takes that many joules for every kilogram for every degree Kelvin. But you could also write it that way. Well, we want joules to come out. We've already got kilograms and kelvins down here, so we need to multiply by the number of kilograms, that's the mass, and also the change in temperature in kelvins. So normally we don't actually write all these units, but you can see kilograms cancel, kelvins cancel, and our answer would come out in joules. So I could have written Q here. You know, some books would write Q. Your solutions manual went with delta E which is why I chose to use delta E. Um, you can write it CM delta T, or uh, you could do it this way. This looks like MCAT to me, those medical exams. You know, if that helps you memorize it, think of it that way, whatever order you wanna write it in. But just look at the units and make sure you understand why, why this equation is what it is. What are we even solving for? Remember, there's no, there's no digital scale to weigh this thing. So she's trying to determine the mass, solve for the mass. Okay, well, we would need to know how many joules she dumped into the sample. And we're not told that directly, we're just told the rate at which energy is being dumped in and for how long. So in other words, that's power times time. Hopefully you remember that from 3A. Take wattage times time interval, that will give you a quantity of energy. So in this case, she's inputting energy at 2,500 joules every second. That's the 2.5 kilowatts. She does so for 30 seconds. Then we divide by the 900 joules per kilogram per Kelvin and a temperature difference of 15 Kelvins. And let's see what we're talking about. We're not expecting a number like 100, right? 100 kilograms of aluminum. That would be extremely heavy. And I don't think you'd be putting that on a heating coil. 2,500 times 30 divided by 900 divided by 15. And we get a very reasonable answer, 5.6 kilograms. So this sample is what, 10 or 12 pounds? Let's check the book. What did they get? 5.6 kilograms. Okay, I think that'll be it for, for uh, tonight. We'll move on to some more difficult problems soon. The next video will include some problems with calorimetry. Hey, here's a word of advice that I'll give you right now. If you're doing this homework right now, and you should be, try doing your calorimetry problems in a spreadsheet. It makes it way easier and it's kind of fun.